I'll ask um, Pastor Stevens to come and bring us the message for the evening. Amen. God bless you, brother. Amen. Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 12 tonight. And I uh, love the song that we just sang. It was perfect for us. Now, tell me the story of Jesus. I'm so thankful uh, that we get to hear that story over and over again. It is a blessed story. Amen. And I can't hear it enough. And uh, that's for sure. And that's a blessing. You know, when we got saved, we got entered into a race, a faith race, a course that God has chosen for our lives, a course that will best serve God's purpose for us, all right? I see a sign back there. Oh, that'll help. I, I can hear myself being uh, amplified, but okay, thank you very much. I appreciate that. And, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, as a pastor, you always have a love-hate relationship with the guys who do the sound. I don't know what the story is there, but anyway, that's a, that's a blessing. Thank you for reminding me, and that's good. Uh, but, you know, uh, the course that God has chosen for us best serves God's purpose for our lives. And, uh, you know, it's okay for us to serve His purpose because we belong to Him. We belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we're not the first to run this race. And there's a whole uh, chapter there of witnesses recorded for us there in Hebrews 11. And they give, fact to, they give e evidence to the fact that uh, they were able to run their races. And God, through what God did through them, they were able to finish the course that God had for them. And so we were told, we talked about this last night, that we're to run this race by laying aside that, uh, you know, the weight, right, Maybe not sin, but some things that are just weighing us down, keep us from running as we should, and then the sin that doth so easily beset us. And you know, I kind of think about that sometimes when I'm driving in my car. It's just like you're driving somewhere and you kind of get boxed in. And you can look ahead and it's like you can make some time if people would just get out of your way, Right? And it kind of boxes you in. That's what sin does to us, doesn't it? It boxes us in and keeps us from making the progress that we should. And we need to lay aside those sins that doth so easily beset us. We need to learn what it is as Christians to have victory over sin. And then, of course, we're to run with that thing we all just so easily have, patience. We're very, you know, by nature, aren't we just so naturally patient People. It's certainly not about how fast we run, is it? It's about keeping in the race. And you know, there's another aspect of running that God wants us to see, and it is where we put our focus. As we're running, what are we going to be focused on? Let's read these verses. Will you stand with me to honor the reading of God's Word? Hebrews 12, beginning in verse number 1. Hebrews 12, beginning in verse number 1. Again, the Bible says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. So did you notice there where he told us our focus is supposed to be? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, the creator of our faith. Without him, we wouldn't have anything to believe in. He's the creator of our faith, and certainly he is the finisher, the completer of our faith. He is about the beginning and the end. In fact, you remember in Revelation 1.8, he said this, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And so he's the first and the last, and he's Everything in between. We're to have our focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, the race that was set before him, he finished. He finished his course. He endured. He got to the finish line and he sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. That exalted position before the Lord. And if we're going to finish, 
We're going to have to keep our eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. We've got to get our eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, tonight, I pray that you would fill me and speak through me, God. We need to hear from you. What an important message this is tonight, God. And so, Lord, I pray that you would guide and direct. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. It's a wonderful thing to have this great cloud of witnesses. Their stories, when you read through them, we get a lot of courage from them. They help us to realize that people just like you and me that had the same kind of struggles in their lives that you and I have, those people finished their course. They trusted God, they obeyed God, and God did great and marvelous things with them. You know, I think that sometimes people get a little off track with these witnesses, and it's almost like the focus wants to be on the witnesses. And, uh, you know, if we, we thought about that for a little bit, if the witnesses were our cause or where our focus was, we would find once in a while a little bit of discouragement. Uh, because even though they finished their courses, you know, still at times they had doubts and they had failures. Think about Noah. Yeah, Noah, Noah got drunk. You, know, you think about Jacob, and he certainly had his issues with sin. Abraham lied about you know, his relationship with his wife and things. And my point is this. If we put our focus on man, we're going to get discouraged. We'll find that man fails us. You know, one of the things that I love about an independent fundamental Baptist church and a pastor like you have, you have a pastor that helps remind you that your focus is not him. Your focus is on the Lord Jesus Christ. He's not trying to get you to focus on Him. I mean, we're all human. We know that we would fail, and the point is that we need to keep our eyes, our focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a lot of things that will distract. There's a lot of things in the world that will distract us. It kind of reminds me of going to a Little League baseball game. And so you got this little kid who gets up to bat, and in the stands are his mom and his dad and his brother and his sister. And in the stands there's that other guy over there that, you know, he knows everything about baseball and he's yelling it out to everybody else. And you got the guys on the team and then you got the coach. And so, you know, everybody's yelling, you know, something here and there. And, 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 and all he's, he's hearing all these voices and he's just a little kid. He doesn't really know who to listen to other than somebody said you're supposed to listen to the coach. You know, I think sometimes as Christians, we hear all these voices. But we've got to remind ourselves who it is we're supposed to be looking to, listening for. Now, there are three reasons given here that are great reasons why we are to be looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. All right? Again, we're talking about running. This is consistent with us running. We're not to have our eyes closed. You ever ran with your eyes closed? And, uh, you know, uh, we have a Christian school, and so the kids, every once in a while, they're doing goofy things. And every once in a while, you'll see them, they're walking backwards with their eyes closed. You know, and it's bound to be a disaster sooner or later in things. God doesn't want us to run that. We're supposed to be running, but we're also supposed to be looking, Right? Looking, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. The first thing that I want to point out to you tonight in this verse, we're to keep our eyes on Jesus because he endured the cross. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, the Bible says, endured the cross. To endure is to take patiently. It's not to recede or flee. It's to laugh. It's to, uh, to last. It's to suffer without resistance. Specifically, he endured the cross. But let's remind ourselves, let's think a little bit tonight about what did he endure on the cross. There's a lot of ways you could look at this, but let's just think about what was said to Jesus while he was on the cross. The Bible says in Luke chapter 23 and verse 35, And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him. Derided him. That means to laugh in contempt. They said, He saved others. Let him save himself if he be Christ, the chosen of God. He was Christ. 
He was the chosen of God. And yet they derided him. I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't do deriding real well. It's just not something I naturally am disposed to. They mocked him. In Luke 23, 36, the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar. They mocked him. They imitated him in contempt. The Bible says in Luke 23, 39, that they, uh, one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. So they railed on him. That's to use insolent and reproachful language against the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, I can kind of understand that coming towards me. I mean, I make mistakes. I've done some dumb things. I've gotten people mad at me, and, and actually, sometimes they were kind of justified in getting mad at me. I mean, when I was a kid, I, you know, I said things I shouldn't say. And people would get mad and angry and say mean things and stuff to you. But this is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's on the cross, and they're deriding him, they're mocking him, they're railing on him. The religious crowd said this, likewise also the chief priest, the Bible says, mocking said among themselves with the scribes, he saved others, himself he cannot save. Basically they're saying he's powerless. They're looking at him on that cross, hanging there, and they're claiming that he is powerless. Of course, he was fitted with a crown of thorns. He was nailed to the cross. He had his side pierced. And, you know, and so he's nailed to the cross. And so these brave men, now that he's nailed to the cross, they're saying, they're thinking in their mind, he was powerless. These were all acts of blasphemy, violence against the sinless Savior. You know, when you think about the cross, you have to remind yourself that there man was doing his absolute worst. But that's really not half the story of Jesus being, being the recipient, uh, being on the cross, because he was also the recipient of man's sin. I want to point out, though, on that cross, there was nothing that happened on the cross that Jesus did not submit himself to. Let's remind ourselves he's all-powerful. And he could have called at any moment 12 legions of angels. And in fact, he could have just spoken the word and destroyed them. He has all power. He's all powerful. You know, and so there's not anything that took place. There's not anything that anyone did to the Lord Jesus Christ on that cross that he didn't submit himself to. But he endured. He endured. A lot of the times you and I have put up with things, but it's only because we were powerless to do anything about it. But he had all power. He could have done anything. And yet he submitted himself to what he was going on. He endured. The worst part of what he had to endure was bearing the sins of mankind. 1 Peter 2.24, it says, Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should, uh, should live under righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. So he took the load, he took the weight of our sin on him on that cross. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. In 1 Peter 3.18 it says, that Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. All the sins that we ever committed were cast on him there. You know, we can talk about the cruelties of the Roman soldiers, and they were extremely cool, cruel to our Lord Jesus Christ. We can talk about the atrocities of the religious crowd and, and their hypocrisies and the horrible things that they did and said to our Savior. I can talk about the horrible behavior of the passers-by. I believe that the cross was, was on this road and, and people just passing by were saying horrible, mean things and spitting on the Lord Jesus Christ. And So I can talk about what all those others have done to the Lord Jesus Christ, but I cannot escape my own role in this matter. Surely, 
Surely my sins were part of the mix. The Bible says he's the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. All my pride, all my lying, all my coveting, all my stealing, all my sin was placed on the Lord Jesus Christ there, as was yours, as was yours, and yet he endured. Why? Sometimes the songwriters will ask the question, why? Well, first of all, because the Father loved us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. He loved us and did not want us to perish, even though he knew that's what we deserved. And so God the Father loved us, so Jesus himself endured the cross. The Father knew the alternative was that we would perish. Another reason why he endured, he endured because, well, he loved the Father. He loved the Father. In John 14, 31, Jesus said, But that the world may know that I love the Father. And as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Arise, let us go hence. I do, I love my Father. I do whatever my Father wants me to do. That's what Jesus is saying. He loved his father so much that he would do anything in that will. In fact, in that night when he prayed, if it be possible, let this cup pass for me. And then he would pray, not my will, but thine be done. Because he loved the father, he was willing to do whatever the father wanted him to do. Another reason Jesus endured, well, because he loves us. In John 4, 15, 9, it says, as the father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue you, ye in my love. It's an amazing thing to understand and realize this relationship of God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and how, you know, He's one, and yet He loves, you know, they love each other and all that stuff, and they love us. It's an amazing thing. That's why He endured. It says clearly, doesn't it, in Romans 5, 8, but God commendeth His love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He endured the cross. And so we're told in our race to look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Endured the cross. He endured more than any other man has ever had to endure. The second reason is we need to keep our eyes on Jesus Because he despised the shame of the cross. Despised the shame of the cross. Again, look at it. It says in verse 2, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. Despising the shame. The word despise means to have the lowest opinion of, to have an extreme hate for, to contemn, to scorn, to disdain. To abhor. Now, I'll just tell you, my church family knows this. I don't like watermelon. I don't like watermelon. I don't mind shooting them. They're kind of fun to shoot. But I don't like watermelon, you know? And some of you like it. But it would be wrong for me to say I despise it. The word that's used here, despising the shame. It would be wrong for me to say I despise it. And, uh, you know, my wife likes it. Some of my grandkids like it. But to use this word for my feelings about watermelon would be overkill. All right? I don't want to eat it. I don't like the smell of it. I don't like the taste of it. And like I say, they're fun to shoot. You ever shot one with a, you know, a, a slug? You know, uh, that's fun. But anyway, this... You know, we think of all kinds of fun things to do, you know, our men do. When pastor admits he hates watermelon, got to do something with it and, and stuff. On the other hand, I could use that term despise for my feelings towards Satan. I have the lowest opinion of him. I hate him. I hate what he does. I hate the things that take place. And so you begin to understand this is not a little word 
This is a very serious, strong word. It's a very strong word. It's not just dislike, but it's the dislike in the highest degree. Jesus, on the cross, the Bible says, he despised the shame. He despised the shame. He disliked it to the highest degree of dislike. So as I studied this, man, I'll tell you what, this gets serious. I shouldn't easily go through this. It ought not to be done haphazardly or lightly. It requires a serious mindset to take a serious look at what the shame of the cross was. One main part of the shame was the nakedness. The word shame in the Bible often is associated or connected with nakedness. Did you know that? In the book of Revelation, in chapter 3 and verse 18, it says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, uh, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. In Exodus 32, 25, And Moses saw the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies. In Isaiah 47, 3, Thy nakedness shall be uncovered, yea, thy shame shall be seen. Now I cannot tell you to what degree nakedness was involved in with Jesus on the cross. I know they took his garments, they made four parts, and each soldier, soldier got a part. They also took his coat, they didn't invite it, but one got that coat by casting lots or gambling. And I can't tell you, I, I don't know, I've read different things and things, whether he was totally naked or whether he still had an undergarment on. That's not what's important tonight. We need to understand, even if it was just that undergarment, it was considered naked and it was considered shameful. Public nakedness was and is extremely sh shameful in the eyes of a holy God. It's bad when someone willingly is publicly naked. But it's so much more worse when a person who is proper and holy is forced to be publicly naked. You see, he who is completely holy, completely holy, was forced to be publicly naked. And can I remind you, his exposure was harsh. Galatians 3.13 says this, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on the tree. That shame was our shame. Again, you think about the fact that he bore our sin, the shame of bearing our sin. Again, who his own self, the Bible says, bear our sins in his own body, his own sinless, perfect, holy body. He bore our sins in that body. He was made to be sin, it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, who knew no sin. I don't know that we catch that very often because it's like you and I, we live in this world of sin. We're acquainted with sin. We know sin. We know it in our own lives. And in fact, to some degree, we're even comfortable around it. But he who was completely holy knew no sin. He had no acquaintance with sin like you and I have. He who was holy, harmless, and undefiled on that cross bore our sin. Again, he took our lives, he took our filthy thoughts, our vile words, our selfish pride, our wickedness, and became sin for us. It's not an experience he had ever had before. Jesus had no such knowledge of sin. He had no experience with sin. He knew it not. Oh, the shame that he must have felt that day as he bore my sin. As he bore my sin. You know, most of us, as, as children, we started out lying to hide 
the disgrace of our sin. When we'd get caught, you know, we didn't want people to think badly of us. So, you know, the easy thing to, for us to try to do as kids is to lie to cover up our sin. We don't want people to have that bad opinion of us. Has there ever been a time when you got caught in your sin and you just couldn't hide the shame? Jesus felt that shame, that disgrace for you and me. I was thinking about this thing that happened many years ago. It kind of helped me to... I, I, I felt a shame over something that was not true. Uh, a man had called our church on a Wednesday, just, uh, early on a Wednesday afternoon, or late on a Wednesday afternoon, I should say, uh, you know, a night before the service, and he was asking for help. And, and so I told him, I said, this is Wednesday night. I said, if you come to church, you know, I can see what, you know, if, we can, if there's something we can do to help you. And, uh, and so he was at a gas station a couple miles away, and so I told him I would pick him up and bring him to church. So I went down to pick him up. He's standing outside a phone booth. I, I know some of you don't even know what a phone booth is anymore, but anyway, he was standing outside a phone booth, and uh, there was a guy on a motorcycle, like a Harley or something, not too far from there. So I got out, and I walked over to the guy at the, the phone, and I shook his hand, and he got in the car, and I got in the car. And this guy that was this motorcycle guy, it looked like something totally different to him than it was. Kind of under his breath, he said something like, stinking gays. So he thought, he thought I was picking this guy up. For a different reason. Boy, I tell you what, it's like, man, as a man, I'm going, I don't want anybody ever thinking that of me. I just, I mean, it's like, I, I, man, I, 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 I bristled. I come back out of my car. I got a church track, and I said, I'm Pastor Stevens of Calvary Baptist Church. I'm picking this guy up, taking him to church tonight. You didn't come to church, you know, and stuff. Because I, it, but for a little bit, it's like, oh. I don't want anybody. <coughs> Excuse me. Is the water okay? <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, I didn't want anyone to think that about me. Can you imagine the shame then that my Savior felt on our behalf? If that sin is repugnant to me, and, and I'm acquainted with sin, what is our sin like to the Lord Jesus Christ? He despised. Do we understand that? The Bible says he despised the shame. But why would he endure something so greatly he despised? Hmm. Why, would he, why would he endure all of that? Jesus endured the cross for one reason, it says here. For the joy that was set before him. For the joy that was set before him. So here's the third thing. He did so for the joy that was set before him. You know, what can be so joyous that it can motivate one such as our perfect Savior to endure the shame of the cross? The insight the passage gives us is the joy happened when he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Set down at the right hand of the throne of God. That exalted position. That joy had to include the reception that the Father gave him when he arrived home. When he arrived home. We have on at least two occasions where the Heavenly Father, during the ministry of Christ here on this earth, he publicly announced his pleasure with his Son. When Jesus was baptized, Matthew 3.17 says, And lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. At His transfiguration in Matthew 17, 5, while He yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye Him. It's kind of interesting, though, because something else took place there with this. In Mark 1, 11, it says this, there came a voice from heaven, this is at the baptism, saying, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Luke 3, 22. 
And the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Some would say this is the same account. But Matthew gave a distinction. Matthew quotes the Father as saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And Mark and Luke say that he said, Thou art my beloved Son. Now, either one of them is misquoting the Lord, or as I believe, he said both. However you view these, the Father made it publicly clear that he was pleased with his Son. He says to the people that were there, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. But then he also said, Thou art my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. He speaks to him directly. Oh, the Father loved the Son. It's very obvious that he loved his Son. And so, in keeping that in context, what do you think it was like when the Son got home? When the Son got home. I love the verse in 2 Peter 1.11. It says this, For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, those who are faithful, I believe God is going to minister a homecoming to them. That's really an awesome thing. You think about it, uh, the Bible says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. That used to kind of a little bit bother me until I really kind of understood it. You see, Paul said, I have a depart a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. We're on the departure side, so we don't necessarily see the death of saints as a beloved thing. But he's on the arrival side, right? He's on the side when they come home. He's on the side, and he's prepared this homecoming for his faithful servants. I think 2 Peter 1.11 is talking about that. Now, wait a minute. If that's true for faithful servants, what was it when his own son came home? You know, when the prodigal son came home, his father greeted him and with a hug and with a kiss. He, he put the best robe on him, didn't he? And he put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and had the fatted calf killed and made a great feast. But he was the prodigal son. I, I think about Matthew 7. Uh, Jesus, uh, the, Jesus said this, If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall the Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? See, our God, our Father knows how to give good gifts. Our Father in heaven. And the Father in heaven knew how to give good gifts to His Son. If God would say to one of His servants, like you and me, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. What would He have said to His perfect Son upon His arrival home? So Jesus said, For the joy that was set before Him, He endured the cross despising the shame. Part of that had to be that arrival when he got home and he was able to sit down on the right hand of the Father, the position of greatest honor. Wow. Must have been a wonderful time for Jesus after all he went through, after despising that, to sit down at the right hand of the Father. That joy, though, also has to include the souls that have been saved as a result of his endurance. Wow, that's pretty awesome. I'm sure you've heard these voices, these verses before, but let me just remind you. In Luke 15, 7, it says, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Verse 10 of the same chapter says, Likewise I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. And sometimes we paint this picture that it's the, the angels in heaven are rejoicing when someone gets saved. But it says they're in the presence of the angels. Do you think maybe the sun's rejoicing? When folks get saved, I do. I think the Father and the Son are rejoicing 
over those who get saved. It's pretty awesome to think that. I, you know, the joy. He, the God so loved the world. He didn't want us to perish. He wanted us. And Jesus said, I want them to come and I want them to see the glory that I had with thee before the, the world was. It, it's a wonderful thing. And I think that there's a wonderful, you know, uh, presence in heaven of the Father and of the Son rejoicing over souls coming to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. I don't know about you, but that kind of thrills me. You know, that's pretty exciting stuff to think about, that the Lord rejoices. You know, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2, 9, But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered in the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. All oh, the joy that was set before him. It's an amazing thing. Just know that he endured the cross, despising the shame, for the joy that was set before him. And just knowing that, it's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing. So, based on all of that, he's saying, keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Uh, he endured the cross. He despised the shame. These are really, really, really good reasons for us to keep our eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the author and finisher of our faith. You know, he, uh, there used to be a time in the medical realm when you went and saw a general physician, you know, the you know, family doctor or whatever, and they kind of took care of everything. But now, I don't, I don't, I'm sure it's the same way here. You got all these specialties. And then you got another specialty, you know. And uh, I, 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 I kind of like the old days when just one person took care of it instead of having to, well, now i got to go see this person, i got to go see that person, all, you know, all these different things, you know, and, uh, and stuff. Hey, and, and things get so confused, if you will. But see, we have in the Lord, we have, you know, everything we need in one. Everything we need in one. You know what? If you have just been saved a short time, you know what? You need to look unto Jesus. If you've been saved a hundred years, you need to look unto Jesus. Because I'm telling you, he's got it all covered from the beginning to the end and everything in between. He knows what we need to do. You need to watch the Lord Jesus Christ. Keep your eyes on him. You know, I don't know about you, but when I'm, I'm of such an age now, when I, when I get out and I walk a path, something that's not even, you know, I, I have to pay good attention to the path. You know, because I might stumble and fall. And, and so in this faith race, it's like, I don't want you watching the path, I want you watching me. Because he knows where everything is that we would stumble and fall over. He knows how to protect us if we just learn to trust him. For a minute, can you go back to that Little League game with me? You got the kid at bat. It's the end of the game. The game's on the line. His mom and dad are there. His brother, his sister. There's other people there. And they're all yelling. The coach is yelling. The kids are yelling. Dad's yelling, swing hard, kid. Hit a home run. The sister's yelling, don't embarrass the family. Sisters never are very encouraging when you're, when you're playing ball. The catcher behind you is saying, strike out. You got all these people. There's that, that guy that thinks he knows everything. and all, all these people are yelling. But then there's another voice. It's the voice of the coach. And I've seen it happen. I've had it happen to me. Sometimes a wise coach calls time out calls the batter, maybe he's been in the third base coaching box or whatever, calls the batter over. He just kind of calms him down. He says, now, I've been watching this pitcher. And every time the first pitch he throws to any batter is a curveball. And you know what? I know you know how to hit a curveball. Don't overswing. Just hit that ball as hard as you can. And you get back in that batter's box and everybody starts yelling again. But you know what? You keep your mind on what the coach said. You keep your mind on what the coach said. 
And I'm telling you, there's a lot of voices out there telling us to do all kinds of things. But you know, so much of the Christian life could boil down to this. If we just get our eyes back on the Lord Jesus Christ. Stop worrying about this opinion and that opinion and what they tweeted and what they, you know, all those kind of things. Just get our eyes back on the Lord Jesus Christ and run the race like he wants us to run. If you're here tonight, you're listening to my voice online or whatever, and you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior, can I remind you He died on the cross? He suffered all of that to pay the price for your sins and mine, for the sins of the whole world. He, he paid the price so anyone and everyone could be saved. And he wants to save you tonight. And what you need to do, you need to repent of that sin that sent Him to the cross. You need to put your trust in Him in his death, burial, and resurrection, and ask him to save you, and he would do that tonight. You get in the race. If you're in the race, I just want to remind you, let's keep our eyes on the Lord. Let's keep our eyes on the Lord. Let's have our heads bowed as we prepare for our invitation here this evening. Let's keep our eyes on the Lord Jesus.